when did uh, this project first get under, uh, first get started? Who uh, brought up, brought up the idea of reforming animals? A guy in London called Rod Weinberg, who's a mutual acquaintance of Eric and I, and put it to us. We thought about it for a while, said no, and then thought about it a little longer and came to the conclusion it wasn't a bad idea after all. We started really putting it together in December, January, December last year, January to January this year, we started taking the thing. What does this Rod Weinberg do for a living? He's oh. now an agent. He's not an agent. He's an, no, he is an agent. He's now officially our tour coordinator. What are their acts that he handled? Hogan. Got Michael Jackson coming in shortly. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. He's from more of a stroke agent, mm -hmm. an entrepreneurial type. Mm -hmm. You all were sort of reunited in 1977 on the record before we were so rudely interrupted. Mm -hmm. uh, was there any talk of formally uh, reforming the band at that time? No. Not whatsoever. We all had independent projects which wouldn't allow us the time to either to record or write. So basically it was just a one-off job. So why did you uh, give your okay to this? Uh, it wasn't a question of giving our okay. We all happened to be in London at the same time with uh, a bit of time available. So we, all we did was go out to my house and borrow the Stones mobile. and. Uh, recording my lounge for a few days. That was all. We didn't make any preparations, nothing. We just did it on the spur of the moment. And that was your first time playing it for five years? Yeah. How did it feel? Uh, bit of a non event, really. Yeah. It was, yeah. We were so ill prepared, I had to go back to my ex wife's house to go into the loft and dig out some albums to find some material. <laughs> What do you mean, just to recall the old material? No, just mm -hmm. to find something to record. Mm -hmm. the, 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 the last album, album. before we were so rudely interrupted. Right. The, not the present album. Yeah. 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 We present. were very well, well prepared. Mm -hmm. and, but uh, I still, I enjoy the album. That before we were so rudely interrupted. Some good playing on it. There was one good thing came out of it. We, we knew what not to do this time around. <laughs> yeah. We made all the mistakes on the 1977 album, mm -hmm. and this time we at least put some preparation into it, selected material, got together, threw everything together, had nearly two hours worth of material, and um, throughout that which did the plan. Worked very hard in rehearsals for about um, four hours, mm -hmm. and uh, <laughs> then went into the studios and tried them out then in a rehearsal studio and then went into a proper studio and recorded them in Germany, mm -hmm. Munich. Yes, no, no. So getting together this time was the first time playing together in five years. However, the actual concerts themselves are the first in 16 or 17 years. Six, 1966. 66 was the last one. 17 years. Last concert, that's the one. Yeah. So this must have been quite a... Uh, I wouldn't say jarring, but it's been quite a... Traumatic? <laughs> Is that the word? I don't know. I thought that's what you looked for. <laughs> well, it was, it was uh, worrying. Because we actually didn't know how well we could play together. Right up until the first moment, we had a sneak preview in London. And before we went on, I think we were all very, very nervous. What had changed? Oh, let's say you as an individual. Uh -huh. I mean, I'm sure you play with a lot of musicians over during the 16 years. How is it getting back together with the old, uh, the old gang? Awful. Awful. Mm. What? Well, I was used to dishing out orders, as I think Chas was as a producer, and Eric was as a band leader, and then um, to uh, try and learn to keep your mouth shut, which is virtually impossible for me. It was never our strong point. <laughs> and uh, everybody was, has a strong ego and forceful personality, so uh, it was a clash of wills. It was rather like having a stage course being pulled by five horses in different directions. Was this a problem in the original lineup, the original band? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is that what eventually broke the band up? Was it was a factor? Was it a factor? Yeah. 
was one of the factors that broke the ban. Lousy management was probably the main factor. Now it's your own experience, I would see what Pardon? What? <laughs> <laughs> I was just interjecting for you, but no, it's just not. Right. Yeah, bad management and uh, dishonest more than that. Right. But with all these years of experience now, you could probably go on and this could have been set up for quite a while then. I doubt it. <laughs> no, the nerves. The nervous system wouldn't stand it. That's it. Well, we just couldn't. I don't think, because we have uh, developed as individuals and have our own lives to live, I think it would be nearly a death sentence to decree that we have to meet and go on continuously. I think we'll do it the best way we possibly can and we'll know instinctively when it's time to stop. Money is not worth, uh, you know, devoting your whole life to a project like this. It's all right when you're younger and you don't have the, uh, the sheet anger of a home or responsibility, but we all have different responsibilities. Mm -hmm. Just out of curiosity, is this more of a lucrative setup than, say, you could have had? Otherwise, mm -hmm. just out of curiosity. How do you mean no, we could have had? Well, I'm sure before this uh, started, you were all involved in your own projects. Uh, mm -hmm. Is this more of a lucrative... Uh, I couldn't keep on doing this. I can't afford the cut and shall we? Is that right? <laughs> Me neither. I'm making less this year than I've ever made since 1966. Is that right? Mm -hmm. That's a real labor of love here. Uh. No, no. <laughs> it's not a good it's, it's, a cool. it's an experiment in living. See, it's almost like an exorcism. <laughs> Getting something out of your system for once and for all. Isn't it? For once and for all. So this has been on your mind for years then? No. No. But um, it seemed like, you know, when, when an outsider brought the idea forward, um, I don't know, we all, we've all for various reasons agreed to do it, you know, so there's strong motives underneath, you know, for everybody's individual reasons are are, are different, but um, it seems like it's getting it out of your system for some reason. And it's coincidental that we all had enough time to do it, just in so the <coughs> studios. Hello, and I couldn't get a deal with a racket company. Is that right? That's right. Did anybody I've been try working for 10 years ago to deal with hmm. Why, why was that? I don't know, you tell me. <laughs> hmm. Did anybody try to talk you out of this, this project? Yeah, so. Really? Why? Well, for the same reason as arms line is, is in the line, you know, that uh, we're like horses pulling in opposite directions. It's very difficult to uh, discipline yourself to uh, I'm not going to say anything this time. I'm just going to shut up and let it ride. And, uh, it's, uh, it's very it's hard. It's, it's not easy. Yeah. But I think we're over the, <coughs> we're over the, um, over the hump now, the worst part. Yeah, and we're broken the back of it. Mm. And I think it, uh, it's, it's a sort of downhill ride from this point on. It's retraining yourself to think collectively rather than think what's best for yourself, what's best for the whole thing or a project. So it's an exercise in discipline as well, then? Yes. As Mm -hmm. What we're looking at is the five guys who were born within three or four miles of each other. After all these years, if we can't settle our differences, what the hell chance is there of peace in the world? Mm -hmm. What chances of nations settling differences? So, providing an example for us all. <laughs> well, insofar as, as you know, so better. Better. As far as the way, if you're responsible for your own life, you, uh, you, do, you, you tend to smother your own inadequacy and your bad side. And if you're with people who are just uh, are dependent on you either to make decisions or to work together with you, and you still insist on, you know, operating both your worst side as well as your, <laughs> as your good side, then uh, you've got to be an idiot. So it's, it's free education, basically. I suppose it's what the Chinese have been doing since 1947. We've just caught on. <laughs> I got my kid back to, to, to this project. How's that? I hadn't seen her for three years, and there wasn't there wasn't a, a way of me reaching her because uh, of the divorce and the unsympathetic uh, court system in, in California. Hmm. And I knew that if I did this tour, um, I'd be on MTV and I'd be on the radio airwaves because it would elevate me higher than it was normally in my normal output. And it worked. Hmm. This child is located in California. Hmm. How old is she? She's eight. Mm -hmm. Eight? 
Yeah. Sir, and she got in touch with you through the airwaves. Yeah, she saw me on MTV and said, That's it. My daddy's coming into town, I've got to go see him. And it worked. I knew that it would happen. I knew it would happen. Nothing would work for me. So that's, that's one good reason for me personally killing which has got nothing to do with teaching anybody a lesson or anything, but uh, it um, certainly shook down uh, what what I couldn't get shaking and moving through through the lawful way of uh, going about things. I think it's because of its unknown quantity. Uh, we all uh, it had the excitement that comes from entering into something you can't actually con totally control in any way which you can do if you have your own family or your own life. And uh, I think that was the main thing. If you boil it all down in the end, it was something which we could do. And we could do it with a shared experience with people we'd known since we were kids. I mean, I've known Eric since I was a teenager. And Chas have known each other. I mean, everybody's known each other for over 20 years. And so there was the safety of knowing that in the end, no matter how low it got or how bad it got, there would be people who in some sense understood you more than you understood yourself. Yeah. Do you think some of your motives could overlap with, say, those of the Hollies who just got back together this year? I have no idea what their motives are. I haven't seen any of them in years. Mm -hmm. we, the last we heard of that was the, the collapse. Oh, yeah. Oh, it's already yeah. collapsed. Yeah, it collapsed. It collapsed. collapsed. It collapsed. Mm -hmm. they, they didn't complete it. Mm -hmm. It fell mm -hmm. so, But we don't know why or what, what the motives were. Of, you know, we haven't met them for a long time. Mm -hmm. There's been several reunions for that with various bands since the beginning of this, uh, this year and when we started out in this project we had no idea that that was happening Is there a no. and, and it just it, it happened it mushroomed and, and, it, and these guys must have been in pre-production as, as long as we were I mean, you can't just go out there you have to think about it first. so um, there's a, been a rash of reunions that have happened and it's been it looks like it's engineered but in a way it's, it's, it's a huge accident yeah it's uh, they're all independent of each other it seems to me just to be confident. But most of these seem to be groups that did uh, gain the, the bulk of their popularity in the 60s. Yeah. So perhaps you were all going through somewhat of the same... Uh, metamorphosis. Metamorphosis. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, maybe when you hit around about 40, um, you so realize you know, it's... Um, mean male menopause. Yeah, something like that. <laughs> <laughs> male menopause. Well, it sure feels good to get out there and kick the shit out of some younger groups. So, mm -hmm. But uh, it's good for your head to realize that life is not over. And not, uh, I mean, it, the, the, the thing that bugs me in, in with people's attitudes when they find out you're in the performing arts, right, is they're, they sort of tie that in with athletics. And it's got nothing to do with athletics. I mean, an athlete is over when he's 27. But uh, a musician, an artist, is supposed to get better. And uh, rock and roll, in particular, and gets kind of confused with with the sphere of ath athletics and athletes more than any other art form there is. You know, so it's in a way for me, it's proving that that I'm that I've been right all down the line and getting involved in the performing arts in the first place because you're supposed to get better to get older. Have you seen this in your contemporaries? It's improvement over the years. Well, in the in contemporaries, most of them are dead. You know, I mean, we're real survivors. I mean, uh, I'm not, I'm not uh, being flippant. I'm not joking about that. I mean, most of the people that we grew up with and, and, and most of our contemporaries are either dead or dying. Um, it's just fight, it's life in the fast lane, you know. But, I mean, I, I, when I say about artists getting better, I'm talking about artists who paint, actors, um, I'm talking, looking at the arts in general, not specifically one field. But uh, when you look at people like Count Basie, Frank Sinatra, Williams, and people like that, uh, Picasso, right? Pablo, Pablo produced until the day he died, every day, rel relentlessly. You know? So much so that uh, it takes a team of art students to work their way through his catalog for the last, since he died. That's the kind of thing to work towards, I feel, in life. Andy Summers. Andy Summers, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it took him a long time, man, to, to, to emerge into, into flower into what, he, what, he's, what he's doing now. He has flowers. Yeah, sure. Yeah.
and he worked hard at it. He studied hard at it too. I mean, you know, when he was playing with me, he was going to college out in the San Fernando Valley in Los Angeles and studying classical guitar at the same time. He, he, he worked hard at it. Deserves his success. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I don't know. <laughs> he was highly impressed by the concert the other day. Um, I think so he sat in the fifth row there, and he noticed that most of the audience were, were comprised of people by his own age, by people who grew up with you in the sixties. How do you look at these these fans now? Are there any, any thoughts on them? Or yeah, it, yeah, that's that's particularly a Japanese thing. Is that right? Yeah. No, no, everywhere no. we've played, everywhere else, it's been real young kids. Really? Who were born, born when we were recording. <laughs> Is that right? And, and that parents, parents too, well, you know, parents, parents too, and, you know, fathers and sons. But particularly, we found that in, in Japan only, that it was our own age group that came to see. Is that right? Oh, yeah. yeah. Especially on the eastern seaboard of America, the, exactly. the audiences were about 70% young kids, you know, uh, no more than 18 year old. Why would they come to see the animals? They, they, they kind of... They don't want to watch us collapse on stage. <laughs> <laughs> they say possibly it's the last time you'll see it. It's proof also of what I was saying before about art and the art not getting old. I mean, it, it's... When I first saw Chuck Berry in Muddy Waters, I was 15 years of age, and Chuck Berry appeared to me to be an old man then. He's still performing now. He still puts out now. I saw Muddy Waters just a year ago before he died, and he was every bit as exciting and electric, electric than he was when I saw him when I was 15. So he passes from generation to generation. Mm -hmm. And I think that each generation can, the, the, each generation that emerges, they all get pushed around in one way or another. So everybody can identify with a song like, It's My Life, or We Gotta Get Out of This Place. Mm -hmm. It means the same to uh, each generation. Mm -hmm. What do you think about, uh, like you said, people like yourself, this age group? Uh, How old is he? 32. Mm -hmm. and, uh, go, uh, and, uh, I don't know. Eric Bad on that angle. I don't know. I think he was a high school student back in the last days. You know? mm -hmm. Well, we're, fo we're found in the tour so far that uh, we've come against people who were fans of the band in the 60s who, who now have uh, control of radio stations, they're editors of the um, mm -hmm. media, you know, the entertainment mm -hmm. editors of the press, uh, journalists, whatever. Um, we'll find that those people are, are in a position to, um, to dictate the output, you know. Um, it's, it's good for us. It's strong allies. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's, uh, uh, I think, possibly a lot of the reason why we had so many young people coming to the concerts in, in the States was uh, it seems that the animal singles um, have been strongly played all these years. You know, they've never, never sort of collected dust. They've always been uh, consistently played. So uh, that's been good for us, too. And it's, it's flattering that, that we've uh, performed songs and picked songs that, uh, that have stood that test of time so well, you know. Mm. So yeah, they were continuing on the playlists, mm. continuing mm. across the board. Mm. Does it feel like sort of a problem catering to that sort of an audience, an audience that young? Or a lack no, of just, no, just play. Work. We just play the way we play, you know. It's we enjoy it. Play it as it lays. Yeah. Not, and, you know, we, we didn't have any intentions of saying, oh, we must be... Um, you know, very contemporary um, and, and do music um, in the current way, you know, we just play the way we play naturally. Rehearse and pick the things that we, li we like. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think the song that we've achieved on the record via the help we got from Steve Lipson, who uh, engineered the record, I think that that helped a lot. It's a, it's a modern, uh, clean uh, radio sound as opposed to, you know, our earlier recordings which had that sort of early sort of two track, four track mud, mud to them, you know. so I think that helps a lot. Yeah, so mm -hmm. but this might overlap with what we were talking about a second ago. wants to know what you think of your contemporaries now. Uh, you've seen their activities over the years now, uh, maybe seen uh, things about can overlap with your own lifestyles and your own uh, careers 
or differences perhaps, what the, any comments you make? You list the stones, the kings, uh, who, uh, even some people that died, Brian Jones, John Lennon, etc. Do you see anything in common, first of all, with some of these people who, for the past 20, not quite 20 years yet, but maybe 18, mm -hmm. 18 years, who have been in the, in the four of the music that I've seen? I think it had to adjust to the idea when we all started, we were amateurs. And uh, we had to invent our own rules for survival. And some were better than others at doing it. But it shows you the strength of that particular scene. Sometimes we people can be accused of talking about the good old days in, in a romantic uh, way of looking back and forgetting how awful it was, etc., etc. But actually, the stock of those people was pretty strong. When you think that the kings can still go out and they've got a hit single in America and it was tour <coughs> continuously, that the Stones have managed to be at the top for all this length of time, that uh, people like McCartney and Lennon and even Ringo Starr and George Harrison were able to have individual solo careers and have lasted this length of time. And I don't think anybody thought or could imagine that 20 years on the same thing would be happening. But you all have maintained rather healthy careers uh, all this time. So you must, have, must possess the same thing. Mm. Yeah, we seem to be. Um, that, that generation in the 60s uh, <laughs> seems to, I don't know, strange. It's a good year. <laughs> no, well, actually, I think what it was, we also were the first uh, crop of young people in England that did not have to do a national service and have their lives taken away from them and go into the forces and lose their development time. And also, there was, there was a great gamble in those days, because no, the rock and roll scene wasn't what it was now. It was very small, and uh, to take that chance was a big gamble, so I suppose if you had the spirit or the strength to do that in the beginning, as long as you remain sort of true to that idea, that was the thing that's managed to help us all survive and persevere. Mm. They have something to do with the fact that we were the first generation, like Alan touched on there, to, to uh, be able to think about uh, peace and war, war and peace in terms of escaping the military conscription but being born during a state of war and emerging from that and, and, and wanting to grow away from it to tear up the old values and the, 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 the state did not get its hands us, on us and train us yeah we were blimps we were, we were, we were John Lennon was a perfect example of that but we were freer you know uh, we were freer than any previous generation to, to follow uh, a whim if you like uh, you, you couldn't afford that luxury in the post-war years or any anything before that. I mean, we were the first ones who could make the dream come true. Yeah, could mm -hmm. just say, I don't want to work in uh, in a shop or a, an office. I want to play rock and roll. Mm -hmm. uh, and and it's gone now. The, yeah, the opportunity is gone now. I mean, the half the countries that I visited are closed now to, to people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You can't even travel. Uh, you can't even make the same journeys physically mm -hmm. now that you could then. And uh, everybody, the kids were rich, man. They made money. Yeah. Kids in the 60s made money. They made more money than their parents did. Mm. No, it's, it, it's, an, it's an alternative to, um, to unemployment, but it's a very crowded field in, in, in the UK now. You know, lots of people want to get into rock and roll, maybe because they can't get a job doing anything else. But there's too many people after too few slots. You know. It's no longer an adventure in the lifestyle because, it, as I say, the rules have now been written. And I think, in a sense, that's why punk came about because they felt, hell, we're not going to follow those rules anymore. And so that's why you get this anarchic, nihilistic attitude. And that was the last big change you felt in the rock structure. But I think the main, well, the main changes have been caused by the technology improvements. Yeah, since then, yeah. It's yeah. split in a way. The, the technology's got cleaner and better, and the attitudes have got scruffier and filthier. And in, 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 in a way, it sort of went you know, like that. You know. And I think that's what's wrong. With, what's been wrong with the with the punk movement is, is that uh, one way they're trying to kick down doors, change things socially, but um, the technological aspect of recording got better. 
It's like trying to write on a wall with a fountain pen. Yeah, right. of the artist, knowing that, you know, I mean, you're supposed to have your own vision and your own attitude, and uh, you have to show a lack of fear, you know. He's uh, enjoying, enjoying doing his work. Sure. Yeah, it's better than working on the ship, you know, isn't it? There's also the thing that it's the first, you know, first time, I mean, Jagger's on record in, uh, in his 20s of saying, I can't see myself being a rock and roller at 30. I mean, that's, that's the sort of attitude of you. Um, we're the first of the generation um, that, that caused the sort of pop explosion of the 60s um, to, to reach the 40s and when you come to be 40 you realize that your life isn't quite over you know you've still got some some uh, gasoline in the tank you know so, so why not why stop just because somebody's you know 20 year old thinks that you're old they took the old V8 out under the freeway for its last run before they put a 55 <laughs> million hour speed limit everywhere and the V8s disappear completely from the face of the planet which they're about to do I think it's, it's still a rebellion at our age because we do feel I mean we've seen it that people are being made more uniform the hotels around the world serve the same food the airlines give the same service even the cars are starting to all look alike and there's a uniformity which has been pressed on us now in this age, in the 1980s, which was also there in the 1950s. And I think we all feel it's dangerous because it takes away your ability to And so that's why whatever we're saying or doing, maybe the chords and the words are pretty similar to what we were doing before, but the attitude is correct is that you must not accept what people tell you to be or do. Hmm. So is there a restlessness propelled by that vision? Mm -hmm. Well, no, I just did well, it, it's not a vision, it's reality. Mm -hmm. What we thought, what we what we instinctively understood then is now a fact. And a lot of people are accepting it. I'm afraid because they're being beaten down by economics. The jobs have been taken away from them and being forced to compete in the way that we weren't. There was full employment when we were around. At least we did have that freedom. They don't have that freedom of choice now. You can especially what feel this in London where you're all located now. Well, we're located in England, you know, we're not necessarily all in London. It's, uh, it's all over the country. It's all over the world, in fact, yes. you know. I mean, we're just today we're, we saw a lot of guys taking an entrance examination to, to work for Sony and we're told there was 2,000 for 30 jobs. 2,000 applicants for 30 all jobs. They were black suits on, white shirts, black ties, white socks, black black shoes, and they all sat like that in the lobby waiting for their turn to go on and, s and go do the exam paper. It's, it's a pretty universal it's thing in, in, in the sort of Western world. Mm -hmm. Well, I went back to California anyway. <laughs> I yeah. feel a sense of personal freedom there that I don't feel anywhere else. Is that right? Mm -hmm. In what way? Well, I can. Uh, get on a bike and ride if I want, I can, uh, you know, I can go down to the coast and swim or if I want to, I can go to the mountains. I can work if I want, I can not work if I want. Um, it's, there's a sense of freedom, there's a sense of, sense of space there that doesn't exist in, in, in Europe. Um, so we have an island race. You know, the Japanese, you know, they do get that island mentality. They get cramped and neurotic. Everybody knows yeah, everybody what you're knows doing. Everybody knows it's like a village, a giant village. Mm. Mm. It's interesting. But in the rest of you continue to uh, except for you, all of you continue to live in London. No, no we're, we're all in the state of flux. We were that's in a sense I suppose the what we've done now is uh, an outward manifestation of the way we feel. Chester sold his house. I just moved back into London two years ago. I lived outside of London for ten years. I moved back in London, I've just put my house up for sale because I wanna, don't know where I want to move to. We're all like gypsies at the moment, right? Mm. Just want to move. And if we find somewhere to live, we're not going to tell you. <laughs> 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 
And what was attractive about London in the 60s is gone. And what was yeah. attractive about a lot of cities is gone. It's, uh, it's, 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 it's the same all over. Everybody's suffering from the same sort of mental break. Economics. Sure. You kind of get around. In America, even when in California, there's, the transit systems are now. Mm -hmm. So you've got, you know, it's, you've got to have money to have a car to buy a pet room to go away. The state has taken away your freedom of movement. Mm -hmm. yeah. You're like a, a mouse on a treadmill. Almost. Well, that's uh, why I'm attracted to California, I guess, because in order to live in California, you first have to have a driver's license and a car. It's, you know, that's required. It's almost in the same. It's to stop yeah. the border. And if they didn't have enough money coming in from the dust bowls in the 30s, to stop them, check them, stop check them. If they had less than a hundred dollars they were turned back, you know, I mean it's always been that way. So once you pay the price of admission into that club, then you got a lot more movement. That's what I like about it. So you, for me, LA, uh, it has its faults and drawbacks, but the thing is, is that it's the most, it's the city with the least um, character. It doesn't impose its character on you. You don't have to play the LA game when you're there. In London, you have to play the London game. You're tied by the transportation systems and the bars are closed at a certain time. I suppose in Tokyo, you have to play the Tokyo game. When you're in Paris, you have the Parisian game. But in Los Angeles, you can impose yourself on the city and, mm -hmm. make, and have the city work for you in a way. You know, and but in most like industrial cities, you know, they're dead now. Mm -hmm. All the people have moved out. I mean, that has been the trend for years, is uh, for people to work in the city but live outside it. And so the city dies, where normally the city was a place for protection and for people to meet and mix. That is dissipating. The um, technology means that people don't actually have to go out and make their own entertainment anymore. I mean, they can sit at home and it all comes to them. It also means that they can turn on the television and be frightened to death and be, be made neurotic and receive information passively and not take any active part in the community or in politics or anything at all. In other words, you're being neutered by your discoveries. In um, fact, scaring them not to go out. Yes, yeah, yeah. terrorizing them by the tube. Streets not are dangerous out there. So I think that you're all pretty uh, uh, offended by this uh, sort of attitude. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. wouldn't it all mm. anybody to be? Nobody likes the to be. The streets can't hurt me. It's dangerous as well. When we were kids, when the Germans used to come over and drop bombs on <laughs> <laughs> And the thing is, is uh, yeah, that's a design for the future, and uh, it's accepted. To you look, look at downtown Houston. People. Look at downtown Houston, a place like Houston, Texas. They're not now there with police power cars, man, nothing. And uh, you know, if you're out walking the streets, you get picked up just for walking. And uh, that's the same thing. They attempted to do the same thing in the '60s, but there was a need, an urgency to get out in the streets and change it and say something about it, you know, and start searching for something new. And that's why I can refer to that period as the good old days with, with some affection and know that it was a degree of reality, you know, and they were good in the old days, I think. We are at the mercy of social planners who have inhuman ideas and ideas. That's the problem. And we still remember how it could be different. So mm. that's, I think that's why we're still out as well. And I think people see us as that sort of, in some ways, in America. When we were touring, and I, I talked to people, they think it's a wonderful uh, thing to come out and see us, actually performing and working hard and still having that same impression and spirit. Because I think they feel they've lost it. Even people in the industry feel that uh, the industry makes their stars and discards them now. They used to in the old days, but at least, you know, you could fight and win if you had an audience behind you. Now, they make their audience by audience research, you know, and they make their artists to sell to them. And so the product in the system is all, and the individual means nothing. Hmm. Struggling to get back to where it was before rock and roll came along and kicked the hole in it. Hmm. In a way, you know, the boy next door, uh, the boy next door image, you know, the uh, groomed, clean, neutered, homogenized, hmm. germ free, hmm. clinically clean. Okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's even worse on the other side of the political fence. <laughs>
And he said he wished he could book the band every week because we're getting twice as many people as he had in his shows on the piano in New York. Yeah. And he's just one thing, uh, most of the guys mm. have said it's been a shot in the arm for me. Why are Because we're the animals. The animals went into No, it's not. I got the humor from that, but that's all. It's that sort of time. Mm. Well, survival. Survival. Mm, survive, but there's the the hero of the survival, the captain of the ship, is still being threatened by a monster that emerges from the deep who can, uh, in effect, represent rock and roll, continually knocking on the door just when you thought it was safe to go in the water, right? <laughs> that fever, just when you thought it was safe to go back on the street. Just when you thought it was safe at home with your VT your machine, you know, because the punk stand the door kicking his with the door. You know. It's, uh... That was the theory behind that, you know? mm. and uh, uh, you know, it's the how I use type character as being rescued by the um, the tiger, the lifeline. Mm. He's being rescued by the animal. How are you? He's being threatened by an animal. He's being rescued by an animal. Mm. You know? So he's, uh, he's uh, in the twilight zone, mm. which is where Howard has been in death and in life for a long time. But I was fascinated by the character. I think yeah, it was very much a sort of individual, uh, for sure. Yeah, yeah. More above anything, he's an individual. And I think that that's the most important criteria in life today. Is what we've been talking about is the stripping away of individual freedoms. Mm. Seat belts, fifty-five miles an hour, helmets on motorcycles, all these little things, you know, like which are designed for your own protection, for your own good. All amounts to a police state in the, in, in the coming, you know. And now, I mean, in West Germany now, they just issued ID cards, new ID cards, that feed into the right. central computer bank. And they have an issue, not that's work. what they're trying to Well, they're, gonna, they're in the works, it's in the works. They've had yeah. one huge strike last year against it by uh, trying to, uh, the people came out in mass. Yeah, the people haven't accepted it yet, it's not, it's not true yet, it's thing they're trying to put Well, it's, it's in the works if they can manipulate it and put yeah. it in the works. The intention oh, is there, sure. the intention is there, yeah. and the threat is there, and the threat is there, and it can be a reality. I mean, if we were in Russia, we'd all be in psychiatric wars. Yeah. Sure. See, we're mad. And look, well, so it's, you know, which side's better? I don't know. That's for the individual. Why the album? We told you. Oh. Survive. I think that music was pop the music spectrum's wider now than it's ever been. In Britain, on radio, and because you have state radio. What's happening in Britain? It's very not, not in America. What's the in American music sound, you know, apart from, you know, there's exceptions, mm -hmm. but the broad thing of American music sounds very much like stamped out of. It's dictated by, uh, again, consumer research, uh, 
And um, I went to see a chap who told me how to sell albums in America in 1977 and sends out these tip sheets to the radio station. And he said, you've got to think of it as a whole spectrum. And uh, when you're marketing things on FM radio, the chop off that end, which is punk, and the chop off that end, which is Frank Sinatra, and what's left in the middle will play 24 hours a day because the advertisers know that that's the lowest common denominator and that's where we'll get the biggest audience. And so it's the researchers who dictate what happens on radio in America. And it's not so in Britain because we have state radio with individuals who are allowed to choose their own program. Is that right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. How are the individuals talking about? Because they have di because they're different individuals and they have different tastes and they listen to different things and they have different preferences and they're allowed to have them. Producers control their own programs and are not subject to the whims of advertisers. I think what's happening in the states is, is the system that I was talking about. The kids, you know, in their own way, rebel against that system as much as they can, but they really can't because it's blocked. Like you say, it's locked up at the end. No, no, so it goes around in a curve and it ends up being heavy metal, and it stays heavy metal. And it, it doesn't move from being 70s heavy metal. You switch on the radio in LA, <coughs> down, uh, Texas, wherever you want. That's and you'll hear uh, Stairway to Heaven. You'll hear Z. And that's where the kids have stayed. And the, the newer bands that have come along that are being promoted as being new and and allowed through the net by the record companies are new sort of trumped up rehashes of the same old thing that are playing the same kind of music. And it's also the death of the individual record shops and a man who was devoted to his music and wanted to sell it to a public, now they buy in bulk from warehouses. The, uh, it's a supermarket. The shelf life of an album is very limited, and that means that you kind of go and discover what you wanted, unless there are very, very specialized shops. And people, again, transport in, in London. I think there may be half a dozen specialized shops but you've got to travel 20, 30 miles to buy the record that you want. It's not there anymore. Mm. And the shelf life of the thing that you want is only about three months, about no, nine months for a hit album, but anything else that gets sent out is only there for 12 weeks, and then it's in the basket and shipped off, and that group, as far as you're concerned, has died. It lived and died in three months. Mm. Mm. Well, you're talking about this, this uh, the uh, exposure to new music being narrowed by this in America. Yeah, in America, but what about all the British imports coming into America? Yes, I'm saying there's a marvelous marriage there because we produce the better music in America buys it. Hmm. We're sort of a sort of a greenhouse, hmm. you know, where we can where groups don't make a lot of money, you kind of tour in England now because of costs and, and survive, but if you get a good record together and you get things going, you go over to America, they'll accept it more because it's an import or an English hat. And it will because it's homegrown. Mm. The same thing happens in the movies. Mm. A cheap movie, a, a low budget movie now is $8 million. So, what chance does anybody have in making movies unless you come up through the said you know, rules that are laid out? And, and, and then the, you have breakaways like in the movies, like you do in music. The Australians came up and sort of managed to kick a hole in the door for a while. How long they're going to keep that up, I don't know, but uh, for a while they did it. The same as the English music. Thing. Mm -hmm. What about for, in terms of your own uh, individual taste, though? Music now. To turn you off. You talked about heavy metal with scorn. Well, it's just not enough. There's not enough. For, there's not enough different mm -hmm. aspects. Uh, you, you really have to go on, on a safari to search for music these days. Um, in the 60s, it was hitting it from every side. All kinds of music, too. I mean, people were into it. People were branching out and listening to people like Ravi Shango. I think they had real, totally diversified uh, tastes in the 60s. And it was coming at you from every angle. Now you get a hunt for it. I think, of course, I mean, people have heroes, you see. Uh, had heroes in the old days, and they wanted to get into them. Now, as I'm saying, because of the limited life and the control that's exercised by it, that would come in, that uh, they, they don't even get to know that individual's part. I mean, you'll have one big group for a year or one big group for two years, and you, you'll find out about them, but there's not that broad spectrum. But it's also because the scene is highly organized, and you make an album in one tour a year, there's not the cross-fertilization between groups 
that they used to be when people have all everybody used to go down to the same bar and sit around and exchange ideas, but just hang out together. And that, not, that doesn't happen so much now. Mm. Because it's big business. It's no longer amateurs getting lucky. It's organized. Mm. Flip to side two after red. You yourself put out Survivor in 78 and then last drive in 80. Mm. And them as imports anywhere else and one of the basic reasons for that was is that um, I'd lost sight of what I was worth in the American arena and I wanted to find out what what I meant in terms of my name so that I, because I couldn't go to a record company and get a true picture the only way I could get a true picture of what was happening for me was to allow my records to come in as imports and go down to the record stores like Tower Records in Los Angeles and say how many imports have you sold on this Eric Burden and, uh, album. and then they would let me know and I would know by the amount of imports that I was selling compared with other imports of how much action there was on my name. And that's what kept me going. These were just made for the German market? Yeah, with German, German, French, and continental musicians. I stayed away from England and I left America in 78. I lived in Germany from 78 until 1980, did a movie in, in Berlin in 1980, and then, uh, then I left Germany and came to London to join uh, this current project. Mm -hmm. did any other records come out before Arc then? We have these two were Survivor and the last drive. Survivor was about 1978. That was recorded and released before that in Europe. It was about 1976, I think. And uh, uh, last drive was '79, uh, '78, '78. Yeah. And that was before. That was the last one before. Yeah. 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 An album called Eric is here was released in '66 mm -hmm. under the auspices of the Animals. Right. Yes, I think this was your solo project. Yeah, it was. It was. Uh, the record, the record company demanded that I keep the name the Animals. Was it Otherwise, it wouldn't, it wouldn't take it a step further forward. Either. So, and I, w I was ready to do what everybody else was doing at that time. <coughs> Stevie was working like that. Traffic, you know, that was his new project. I was looking for a way of doing that and uh, I was stopped by a uh, record company in management. There's no good in it. Um, okay, I a double album called Foreign Price. Yeah. Was that followed by any other albums? I remember, I think there was, yeah. Uh, I had a one called Shouts Across the Street. I had another one called uh, Just For You, um, I had another one called Rising Sun, um, yeah I had about four or five albums after that. Uh, this is a, uh, another one for the Animals Trivia Collection here. Uh, was your last recording uh, session together, uh, don't let me be misunderstood, or? They went on home to me, for me, when I was there. They went on up to me. Okay. Was your last, what was the last one for the... Don't bring it down. Don't bring it down. What was the last one when it came out food and the new animals? Oh, I see. There's a new band on Tyler from that point. I caught it, but the new one. What did you want to do? She's here right now. She's here right now. Yeah. Animalization. That was the last original album. No, I was no, no, I had left. John had the, by then as well. The, the, band, the band broke up in, in summer of '66. I left in sort of April of '66. The last single I was on was uh, Inside Looking Out, and the last album I wasn't on Animalizations. Animalism. Animalism. Um, I, I can't remember what the album was. Animal trucks. Animal trucks. Yeah. I was in the 
Anyway, inside looking out was the last thing that, that I was on. He just wants to set the record <coughs> straight for the animals to answer. <laughs> set it straight for us as well. <laughs> you should have brought along a historian. Three minutes. A rather vague question wants to know from each of you what, uh, say, both, uh, movies or music or anything that's uh, given you substantial inspiration. Let's just say recent. E.T. E.T. No, E.T. Um, extra textual. Yeah. And he says ETY. So <laughs> not just ET. Uh, it was uh, well it was very good. I had to judge it in a in a competition. Yeah. Really? Yeah, for the British Oscars. Uh, the British Oscars. Oh the Oscars. And now I went along to listen to the music. I was asked to go along for the music that I did. I enjoyed the films. Because it was simplistic and entertaining and optimistic. All the things I'm not. Where are they, gentlemen? Well, well I'm really waiting for Costa Grievous's next movie. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. Costa Grievous. Mm -hmm. But I'm waiting for his next movie. I'm always waiting for his next movie. Mm -hmm. the last one was missing, right? Mm -hmm. So that was not. That was up for the music. Yeah. Oh, really? Who did the music for? Van Dyke Parks. What's his name? Van Gelles? Van Gelles. Van Gelles. Van Gelles. Van Gelles. Van Gelles. More recent inspiration? Yeah, so it could be all, you know, maybe the first thing got started. War Games is good. Games? Yeah, big hit in America. So, it's about Felix yeah. Briggs, the computer bank at the CIA, the, the um, strategic air command headquarters by and it flew. And, and, and it really uh, sets off. Uh, starts up a thermal nuclear war. Nuclear war. Mm -hmm. I wasn't that impressed with that. I've not seen it under the best conditions, mind you. Um, oh, you should see it on the big screen. It's terrific. Mm. I found it. I enjoyed it. It was a movie. We sat, Madeline and I, and Stephen sat, all the three of us, and mm. all took it. Mm. I wouldn't say it was inspirational. No, no. Stephen, no. just out of curiosity, just wanted to see. You are wondering what your source of inspiration is. Music. Music. Hunger. Huh? Hunger. Sure. Three children. <laughs> wife and the next wife to feed. <laughs> yeah, so I'm basically in the same boat. Everybody's gone. Sounds more like a vacuum. A vacuum? No, on the, on the contrary. Inspiration. Buddhism. Buddhism. What kind of Buddhism? Mission Shoshu. Unexpected. So? Unexpected. I've been in the past 13 years. Is that right? <laughs> and it's almost gone to try. <laughs> 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 I don't know who he's I don't know. I just catch it up a bit, right? Get this all the time. <laughs> <laughs> the slanderers of Mitchin are like the bottom of stray dogs, but none of the old is goes out of all the line. Hmm. Oh. Did you think of that? No, Nam Nam Yoho and Rengikyo. Is it, what is it? Nam Yoho Rengikyo. Nam Yoho Rengikyo. Nam Yoho Rengikyo, Nam Yoho Rengikyo. All right, well, thank you very much. Cheers. You're welcome. Yeah, I know. Right. Good. Hope you enjoy it. You like it? Could you give me your breath?
It's retraining yourself to think collectively rather than think what's best for yourself, what's best for the whole thing. For a project. So it's an exercise of discipline as well then? Yes. As a musician. Mm -hmm. One way to look at it is the five guys who were born within three or four miles of each other after all these years, if we can't settle our differences, what the hell chances the peace in the world? Mm -hmm. What chances the nation settling? So, providing an example for us all. <laughs> well, insofar as, as you know, as far as, as far as the way, if you're responsible for your own life, you, are, you, do, you, you tend to smother your own inadequacy and your bad side. And if you're with people who are just uh, are dependent on you, either to make decisions or to work together with you and you still insist on, you know, operating both your worst side as well as your, as your good side, then uh, you've got to be an idiot. So it's, a, it's free education, basically. I suppose what the Chinese have been doing since 1947. We've just caught on. <laughs> I got my kid back to do this project. How's that? I hadn't seen her for three years and there wasn't, there wasn't a, a way of me reaching her because uh, of the divorce and the unsympathetic uh, court system in, in California. Mm. And I knew that if I did this tour, um, I'd be on MTV and I'd be on the radio airwaves because it would elevate me higher than it was normally in my normal output. And it worked. Hmm. This child is located in California. Hmm. How old is she? She's eight. Eight? Yeah. Is that right? And mm -hmm. she got in touch with you through the airwaves then? Yeah, she saw me on MTV and said, That's it. My daddy's coming into town, I've got to go see him. And it worked. I knew that it would happen. I knew it would happen. That would work for me. So that's, that's one good reason for me personally doing which hmm. has got, got nothing to do with teaching anybody a lesson or anything, but uh, it um, certainly shook down uh, what started you all involved in your own projects. Uh, is this more of a lucrative? Uh, I couldn't keep on doing this. I can't afford a cut and salary. <laughs> Is that right? Me neither. I'm making less this year than I've ever made since 1966. Is that right? Mm. That's a real labor of love here. Uh. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a real <laughs> It's an experiment <laughs> in living. Mm. See, it's almost like an exorcism. <laughs> <laughs> Getting something out of your system for once and for all, isn't it? <laughs> So this has been on your mind for years then? No. No. But um, it seemed like, you know, when, when an outsider brought the idea forward, um, it, I don't know, we all, we've all, for various reasons, agreed to do it, you know. So there's strong motives underneath, you know, for everybody's individual reasons are, are, are different, but um, it seems like it's getting it out of your system for some reason. And it was coincidental that we all had enough time to do it. Chess and so the <coughs> studios. Hello, and I couldn't get a deal with a record company. Is that right? Right. Did anybody? I've been working for ten years without a deal with a record company. Hmm. Why? Why was that? I don't know. You tell me. <laughs> hmm. well, did anybody try to talk you out of this? This project? Yeah, myself. Really? Why? Well, for the same reasons as I was lying. Like, uh, in the line, you know, that uh, we're like horses pulling in opposite directions. It's very difficult to uh, discipline yourself to uh, say, I'm not going to say anything this time, I'm just going to shut up and let it ride. And, uh, it's, uh, it's very it's hard, it's, it's not easy. Yeah. But I think we're over, <coughs> the, we're over the... Um, over the hump now, the worst part. Yeah, we're over the back of it. Yeah. And I think it, uh, it's, it's a sort of downhill ride. Uh -huh. I mean, I'm sure you play with a lot of musicians over during the 16 years. How is it getting back together with the old, uh, the old gang? Both. Oh. Mm. Well, I was used to dishing out orders, as I think Chas was as a producer and Eric was as a band leader, and then to uh, try and learn to keep your mouth shut, which is virtually impossible for me. It was never our strong point. <laughs> and uh, everybody was, has a strong ego and forceful personality so and, uh, it was a clash of wills it was rather like having a stagecoach being pulled by five horses in different directions was this a problem in the original lineup the original band yeah mm -hmm. is that what eventually broke the band up was it was it a factor, was it a factor? Yeah. yeah 
was one of the factors that broke the van. Lousy management was probably the main factor. Now it's your own experience, and I will see you welcome. Pardon? What? <laughs> <laughs> I was just interjecting. No, it's just not. Right. Yeah, bad management and uh, dishonest more than uh, right. But with all these years of experience now you could probably go on and this could have been set up for quite a while then. I doubt it. <laughs> no, the nerves. The nervous system wouldn't stand it. That's it. Well we just couldn't I don't think because we have uh, developed as individuals and have our own lives to live, I think it would be nearly a death sentence to decree that we have to meet and go on continuously. I think we'll do it the best way we possibly can and we'll know instinctively when it's time to stop. Money is not worth, uh, you know, devoting your whole life to a project like this. It's all right when you're younger and you don't have the, uh, the sheet anger of a home or responsibility, but we all have different responsibilities. Mm -hmm. Just out of curiosity, is this more of a lucrative setup than, say, you could have had? Otherwise, mm -hmm. just out of curiosity. How do you mean that we could have had? Well, I'm sure before this, uh, when did uh, this project first get under, uh, first get started? Huh? Who uh, brought up brought up the idea of reforming animals? A guy in London called Rod Weinberg. He's a mutual acquaintance of Eric and I. He put it to us. We thought about it for a while, said no, and then thought about it a little longer and came to the conclusion it wasn't a bad idea after all. We started really putting it together in December, January, December last year, January, up to January this year, we started taking effect. What does Rod Weinberg do for a living? And he is now an agent. He's not an agent. He's an, no, he is an agent. He's now officially our tour coordinator. What are their acts that he handled? Alvin. Alvin. Got Michael Jackson coming in shortly. Mm -hmm. mm. He's promoted a stroke agent, mm. an entrepreneurial type. Mm. Mm. You all were sort of reunited in 1977 on the record before we were so rudely interrupted. Mm. Uh, was there any talk of formally uh, reforming the band at that time? No. Not whatsoever. We all had independent projects which wouldn't allow us the time to either to record or write. So basically it was just a one-off job. So why did you uh, give your okay to this? Uh... It wasn't a question of giving our okay. We all happened to be in London at the same time with uh, a bit of time available. So we, all we did was go out to my house and borrow the Stones mobile and uh, record in my lounge for few days that was all. We didn't make any preparations, nothing. We just did it on the spur of the moment. And that was your first time playing it for five years? Yeah. How did it feel? Uh, a bit of a non-event, really. Yeah. It was, yeah. We were so ill-prepared, I had to go back to my ex-wife's house to go into the loft and dig out some albums to find some material. <laughs> sure. What do you mean, just to recall the old material? No, just mm -hmm. to find something to record. Mm -hmm. This was the last album. album. Before we were so rudely interrupted. Right. They're not the present album. Yeah. 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 We present. were very well prepared. And, but uh, I still, I enjoy the album. That before we were so rudely interrupted. Some good playing on it. There was one good thing came out of it. We, we knew what not to do this time around. <laughs> yeah. We made all the mistakes on the 1977 album. And this time we at least put some preparation into it, selected material, got together, threw everything together, had nearly two hours worth of material, and um, threw out that which didn't apply. Worked very hard in rehearsals for about um, four hours. <laughs> and uh, then went into the studios and tried them out then in a rehearsal studio, and then went into a proper studio and recorded them in Germany, mm. Munich. So getting together this time was the first time playing together in five years. However, the actual concerts themselves are the first in 16 or 17 years. 1966. 66 was the last one. 17 years. Last concert as the animal. Yeah. So this must have been quite a, uh, well, I wouldn't say jarring, but it's been quite a... 
Stromatic? <laughs> Is that the word? I don't know. I thought that's what you were looking for. <laughs> well, it was, it was uh, worrying. Because we actually didn't know how well we could play together. Right up until the first moment, we had a sneak preview in London. And before we went on, I think we were all very, very nervous. What had changed? Oh, let's say you as an individual.